Recently, both Dr. Paul Saldino and Thomas DeLauer have been talking about a key metric that has been discussed inside the bioenergetic sphere for, the, for years at this point. This metric is the DHEAS to cortisol ratio, and it's extremely important in understanding what your general level of stress is. So in this video, what I'm going to do is explain what this, this ratio actually shows us and why it's so important, what the ideal ratio is that you should shoot for, and also what are four steps that you can do to recover your DHEAS to cortisol ratio if that ratio is indeed low. Now, spoiler alert, if you want to know the ideal ratio and how to recover, stay tuned to the end of the video where I'll give you the specific steps and the specific ratio. So first things first, in order to understand why this ratio is so important, you need to understand the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland, and I'm gonna pull up a graphic here. The adrenal gland is, a, is the gland that sits right above the kidneys. And essentially its job is to actually manage your stress response. And so there's two major portions of the adrenal gland. There's the adrenal medulla, which is this internal portion of the adrenal gland. And then there's the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal medulla is involved in releasing the catecholamines, which is adrenaline and noradrenaline. When you're under stress, and they have very specific effects. I won't talk about them in this specific video, but stay tuned for future videos on them. And you have the adrenal cortex, which produces the hormones cortisol, DHEA, and then also aldosterone. And the main ones we're going to talk about are cortisol and DHEA for this video. Now, what is cortisol's role in the body? And this is going to be important to understand because it'll help us understand why this ratio between cortisol and DHEA is important. So cortisol is the catabolic hormone of the body. Its job is to break down the body's stores and structures to provide resources and fuel and also help with the distribution and prioritization of the utilization of the, those resources and that fuel when the body's energy demand is high and or the body's fuel supply is low. So cortisol's major functions are to lower inflammation via immunosuppression. Its job is to decrease the storage of carbohydrates while also increasing the release of stored carbohydrates, in the, which is known as glycogen. It's also, its job is to increase the production of glucose at the liver in a process called gluconeogenesis from amino acids, glycerol backbones from fats. The amino acids are coming from the protein tissue, which is your muscle tissue, and also from lactate. The other thing that cortisol does is it increases muscle protein breakdown, and it also increases the release of fat, specifically from subcutaneous stores, while over time with chronic cortisol activation, increasing the storage of fat to the visceral stores, the storage around the belly, around the abdomen, around the central organs. Now, cortisol also increases the release of a stress hormone called glucagon, which helps to drive that production of glucose from the liver, from the amino acids and the glycerol backbones from fats and also lactate. And it also lowers insulin and also creates insulin resistance over time. Now, the last thing that cortisol does, and at least the last one I'm going to mention, is that it increases fat oxidation in the mitochondria and increases energy output at the mitochondria. And over time, this can actually come at a cost and actually degrade the mitochondria, which is why people tend to get into a chronic fatigue state after extreme levels of stress. And so these are the major functions of cortisol. In acute circumstances, if you are sick, if you have an extremely stressful circumstance, or you have an athletic event, or you're not eating enough food, you're fasting, you're, you're starving, whatever the different circumstance is, this is helpful to help us manage these different, these different contexts that we find ourselves in. However, over the long term, as you can see, this causes many issues in the body. Now, DHEA's job is to essentially control the effect of cortisol by having the opposite effects of cortisol. So when you're under stress, the adrenal gland releases both cortisol and DHEA. And what it does is the DHEA protects the body from the effects of cortisol. It's basically a buffering agent. And so you want the reason this DHEAS to cortisol ratio is so important is because it's telling you, do you have these, the, this effect of unopposed cortisol, these long-term negative effects, or is your adrenal gland still helping you to manage the effects of cortisol by pumping out DHEAS? And with this, what happens over time is as you're under stress or you're sick or you're 
whatever the different circumstance is, the portion of the adrenal gland that produces DHEA degrades and the portion that produces cortisol does not. So this ratio is telling you what is your chronic stress level. And this is why it's so important. And it's such an uh, essential metric that is looked at inside the bioenergetic sphere because the, the stress or the idea of stress is central to the overarching perspective in terms of understanding energy. So DHEA's specific functions is it actually improves immune function. It protects the brain, whereas cortisol actually has a negative impact on the brain over the long term. It maintains bone mass, where cortisol actually degrades bone mass over the long term. It maintains muscle mass, whereas cortisol degrades that muscle mass. It improves metabolic function, whereas cortisol decreases metabolic function or worsens metabolic function. And it also helps to lower fat mass, whereas cortisol actually can redistribute fat and actually increase fat mass and decrease muscle mass over time, which is not ideal. Now, as we age, something that's important to understand is that this ratio tends to worsen because DHEA levels drop and cortisol levels rise. So I have a graphic here to show you this. And so see, we have a graph here on the bottom, on the x-axis, we have age. And on the y-axis, we have DHEAS levels. And so what we see is when we're young, we don't really have a lot of DHEA levels, right? And as we hit about 25 years old, we peak with our DHEA production from the adrenal gland and over time it starts to fall. And by the time we're about 60, 70, 80, our levels are quite low. Now, as when we keep the effects of DHEA in mind, this obviously isn't so good for our health, especially when we consider that cortisol actually stays steady, if not increases with age. So we see here, we have two graphs here. On the x-axis, we have age. And on the y-axis, we have cortisol levels, salivary cortisol levels. And what we see in their, their one hour after waking, which is where they would tend to be at their peak. And what we see, or around the peak, essentially, what we see is that over time, over the lifespan, we have two lines here. The black dots are males, and then the open dots are female. And, and over time, the cortisol values actually increase with age. So as we get older, we get put into a circumstance where we have an unopposed cortisol state, where we basically, as we get older, we're in a chronic stress state. And we're, the cortisol is degrading our muscle tissue, causing us to increase our body fat around our, our abdomen, around our belly. It's degrading our bone mass. It's having negative effects on our brain, impairing our immune function, damaging our mitochondrial function. And we don't have that buffering effect of the DHEA, which is obviously not ideal. So this is important to see is that as we age, this metric actually tends to get worse. Now, this doesn't actually have to be the case. And we'll talk about how to manage that in just a few minutes here. Let's talk about what the effects of chronic unopposed and excess cortisol are. So coming from the research, what we see is that excess cortisol can cause that visceral fat gain, as I mentioned, that fat gain around the belly. It can cause fatty liver. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause insulin resistance and diabetes. It can cause immunosuppression, making you more likely to get sick, especially as you get older. We see that elderly people are more susceptible to infection. It can cause bone loss, muscle loss, skin and connective tissue loss, so destroying the joints and the skin, creating more wrinkles. We can also see damage to areas of the brain like the hippocampus, which are essential in memory formation. Over time, with high levels of cortisol, you can see increased stomach ulcers. You can see impairment of the gonadal function, so that's the testicles and the ovaries, and a lack of production of progesterone and testosterone as we age, or, uh, or also dihydrotestosterone. You also see impairment of thyroid function, so chronic stress and excess cortisol and, and also unopposed cortisol can have a negative effect on the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. And we also see mitochondrial damage where the chronic stimulus of cortisol on the mitochondria can actually lead to damage over time. So all in all, the effects of this unopposed cortisol or excess cortisol are really not good for health. And then we also can see states, there's also problems with having low DHEAS in and of itself. So when we, with inside the research, low DHEAS is associated with an increased risk of mortality in, in the elderly, an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in men, decreased insulin sensitivity, negative effects on muscle mass and fat mass, worsened immune function, increased oxidative stress, negative effects on bone mass, in women, it has a lower DHEAS value, has, is associated with worsened fertility, 
And also over time, we see worsened cognitive function with lower DHEA values because DHEA is a neurosteroid that has a multitude of beneficial effects inside the central nervous system. So with all this in mind, what is the ideal ratio of DHEAS to cortisol? The ideal ratio is a 10 to 1 ratio of DHEAS to cortisol, at least a 10 to 1 ratio. So that means if we have 10 parts cortisol, we want to have at least 100 parts DHEAS. Now, something important to understand here is when you're getting your labs, you want to specifically measure DHEAS versus cortisol, not DHEA by itself. DHEAS is the storage form, the sulfated form of DHEA. And this is basically, this tells us our pool of DHEA that we have, whereas the actual DHEA value by itself can fluctuate based on your stress state. Because if you're under acute stress, the DHEA value can raise. And so that's more of a, of, uh, of a marker of acute stress than it is a marker of chronic long-term stress or aging, whereas the DHEAS to cortisol ratio is. Now, with this said, what are four steps that you can actually do to improve this ratio if it's not looking too good for you at the moment? Number one, we want to actually lower our stress levels. So if we're excessively exercising, if we're fasting, if we're eating a very low calorie diet, if we're sleep deprived, if we have a high amount of emotional, psychological, or financial stress, we want to get these things under control because essentially as we still have these stress stimuli going on, even if we do all the next steps after, it's going to be hard to actually manage things. So we need to basically take the demand off the body. And so we want to first things first, take that excess demand off the body, and then we can start to replenish and rebuild the body's stores and resiliency. So the first thing is take those stress levels down for whatever your specific context is. And when I'm working with clients, this is one of the first things I do. If I have somebody who's coming from keto, carnivore, low carb, low calorie dying, dieting, plant-based, they're having sleep issues, they're fasting, they're exercising excessively. One of the first things I do if they are having significant stress issues is get these things under control. And then it's not that you have to never exercise or anything like this again. It's just for a period of time to allow yourself to recover. It's important to take the pressure off the system. Now, step number two, once you take the pressure off the system is you want to replenish your nutrient stores, both your macronutrients and your micronutrients, because chronic stress can actually start to deplete the different nutrient values and make it hard to replenish them. If you're still under that state, it can waste these different components. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we have enough vitamins and minerals on a regular basis, but also enough calories, protein, carbs, and fats for what our body specifically needs. And so if you're looking to actually dial this in, I do have a free PDF guide and video course on my website, mikefave.com called the nutrition blueprint that you can pick up to actually figure out how much energy you need, how much protein you need to save your lean metabolically active tissue, like your muscle tissue, how much carbohydrate you need to improve your metabolic function and improve your insulin sensitivity. And also how much, what the protein, to carb ratio is that you need to keep stress low and how much fat you need to dial in your digestion, your hormonal and your hormonal function. So you can check that out on my website at mikefave.com. There'll also be a link in the description. In terms of some of the micronutrients that you want to optimize, though you basically want to cover all of them because they're involved in multiple steps of the stress pathway. So you have vitamins A, D, K, and E. You have the, the B vitamin complex, vitamin C. It's important to balance sodium, potassium, and get enough of both. Also calcium and magnesium, and also calcium and the phosphorus. We also want to get zinc and copper under control, and also manganese and selenium. And I talked about some of the foods you can use to cover those inside that nutrition blueprint. You can check that out there. Now, the next thing you want to do, once we have diet organized, we've lowered stress to expedite this process. We want to get the stress hormones under control. That's going to be cortisol. That's going to be adrenaline, noradrenaline, the catecholamines, and also glucagon. So some substances that you can use to help get these things under control are things like rhodiola, cordyceps. You can take those in the morning to help lower the stress without necessarily knocking you out, making you sleepy. Throughout the day, you can dose things like L-theanine, taurine, and glycine, maybe in a bit of juice or in a bit of tea or something like this. And then in the evening, you could try something like ashwagandha, shizandra, and lemon balm to actually help to lower the stress and help you sleep at night. There's other things that you can use, but these are some of the major things that I'm using with clients. Again, once I get those other areas dialed in, 
to help take the edge off of the stress that they're experiencing on a regular basis. There's other compounds like cyproheptadine and also aspirin that can be useful, but I would talk to a qualified health practitioner about using those before you go ahead because they are medications. After that, once you've taken the stress down, you've replenished nutrients, and then you've also directly lowered those stress hormones with some of these substances, you can start to support these other hormonal systems that run in opposition to the stress systems. So on one side, you have cortisol, the catecholamines, glucagon, serotonin. And on the other side, you have things like DHEA, pregnenolone, progesterone, thyroid, and testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So once you lo start to lower these, you're going to want to shift and increase these systems again. And so if you need to, you can bring hormonal support on board, DHEA, pregnenolone, and then for both men and women can, have been help, can be helpful to lower the stress and start to recover from it. And also progesterone can help with women, whereas testosterone and dihydrotestosterone can help with men. And then thyroid is something that can be helpful for people as well, especially if their thyroid function is low from the chronic stress. And again, these are all things that I would look to a qualified health practitioner to help you organize and see if they are necessary in your specific case. But these would be the four steps that I am looking to address with my clients or that I would look, and look to address in general to help get stress under control. So with that, that wraps up this video. If you like this video, please leave a comment below and like it. And if you're interested in picking up the Nutrition Blueprint, you can do that at my website, mikefave.com.